Doc, the scientist, has invented a time machine out of a car called a DeLorean. Now, the way this works is when you get inside, there are these circuits where you can punch in the numbers and decide where you want to go either forward in time or back into the past. Then you've got to speed the car up. Once it reaches 88 miles per hour, there's a nuclear reaction with 1.21 gigawatts of electricity instantly sending the car back in time or forward into the future. That's your basic premise. There's a scene actually in the third movie, there are three of them, that I think about a lot. And I think it applies to what brought us here tonight for an event like this and what runs through the stories that you're going to hear from our speakers this evening. Imagine being at a, an old drive-in theater because that's where Doc and Marty are. It's abandoned, so there's lots of open space. There's a fence around the outside to keep the gawkers out. On the other side of the fence, it's just wide open desert, as far as the eye can see. Now, they want it that way so that when the car goes into another time, in this case, the past, they know that there's not going to be like a skyscraper there to run into or something like that. So Doc instructs Marty, said, okay, what I want you to do is get into the car and hammer the throttle and go straight that way. And when you reach 88 miles per hour, then there shouldn't be anything around. You'll have some open desert and you should be good. And Marty starts to panic. He says, but Doc, if I go that way, I'm going to run straight into that fence. Doc says, and this is the part that I think about a lot, you're not thinking fourth dimensionally. What the hell does that mean? Stay with me here for a second. He reminds Marty that when you go that way, if you stay on the gas, you'll reach 88 miles per hour, which means that you'll be transported back in time and that fence won't even be there. How does that apply to what we're doing? What are the fences that are keeping us all from mashing the throttle toward what we most desire and deserve? Doubt's a great one. Sometimes they're things that we're dragging along with us from our past. Sometimes it's things that we've made up, stories of things that we think that we're going to face in the future. Whatever it is that we want to call them, it keeps us from really going into what we want because we're not thinking fourth dimensionally. I've learned through trial and all kinds of heaps of error, those fences tend to dissolve or resolve themselves, but only if we run straight at them. However, I've also found that we don't necessarily need to be ready for a, a nuclear reaction caused by plutonium <laughs> and to be that aggressive to get things working in our favor. We can just recognize what's important to us and acknowledge them. I'll give you a real-world example. I'll use one of my own stories as an example. And for this, we've got to go back into the past to around 2010. At this point, I was newly separated, headed toward divorce, the business that I was a partner in had failed, so it kind of shut down and put me out of a job. I was drinking pretty regularly every night. I was on two different antidepressants. I was rocking it. Shortly after that, that I met Caroline. No wonder, eh? What a catch. <laughs> I had a lot of fences. I wasn't really thinking much about mashing the throttle on anything in my life. And we all, I think, go through periods of time like that. It's part of the human experience where... Stuff happens in life. It was at that time I read a book called Five Wishes. That's it right there, by a guy named Gay Hendricks. It's a great book, but I can save you the time and trouble of reading it. The essential premise of this book is to imagine yourself at the end of your life. And maybe even right now where we stand today. Suppose this were it. Now look back on your life into the past. And ask yourself, was it a success or was it not? And why? But no cheating. You can't just compare with the things that you think you should have done or what you see other people doing or the, you know, accepted idea of what a life should be or what success is. But to you, to what really matters to you, that if you didn't have any more sand in the hourglass, what are the things that you wish you'd said or not said or apologized for or at least tried? Was it a success for you or not? And honestly, I did this exercise and I answered for myself, no. No. I've done a lot of things that I'm very proud of. But in terms of what really mattered most to me, 
This is the exact sheet of paper that I wrote on that day. I'll tell you exactly what it says of why my life at that time, I thought, was not a success. I know there's supposed to be, I didn't write a New York Times bestseller on here, or I didn't become a multi-billionaire, or I didn't have a house by the sea, or anything like that, right? Number one, it says, I didn't have a conscious, loving, passionate relationship with a conscious, loving woman who adored me. Number two was, I didn't have fun in my work. Number three, I didn't fully express and share my creative gifts. Number four, I wasn't fully present and happy in every moment. And number five, I didn't inspire and assist others in creating and finding a greater quality of life for them. There was a sixth here about didn't earn the amount of money to match my potential. <laughs> but you'll notice that that's well down the list. Now, after I wrote this, then the next step in the book is it suggests, well, you take those reasons why you think maybe your life is not a success and turn them around and affirm it is a success because these are the things that we're choosing for ourselves. And now we've got kind of an action list of items that we can get to work on right from that point forward. So we don't get a little bit further down the track into that fourth dimension with those same regrets. I can share with you that at that time, I wasn't really full of much piss and vinegar. Nothing much happened <laughs> for, for a little time. But what I didn't understand at that time, that just by thinking about it, just by acknowledging it, just by going inside yourself and, and, and honoring what's real, what you feel, not what you think you're supposed to have or do or be, but what is. And then if you write it down, you start moving universal energy in your favor and weird interesting stuff starts to happen. And then as you start seeing that stuff happen, well, then you start creeping forward. You maybe don't have the throttle mashed all the way yet, but now you've got some momentum. And since then, boy, oh boy, that conscious loving woman showed up and we've worked hard at what is now a fantastic relationship and she's going to tell you a story from this stage here tonight. I look around at where I am, I'm looking at you and I'm thinking about this not having fun in my work. I don't know about you, I hope you're enjoying yourself because I'm having a friggin' blast up here. I love this. And in terms of inspiring others and asking them not to employ somebody else's model, but for you to be you, to come to something like this and to just take little bits and pieces away from others who are saying, no, I'm just going to share. This is what I've been through. I'm not saying this is what you should do or shouldn't do, but this is what's worked for me. This is what hasn't worked for me. And here's what I've learned from it. And those things that we tend to judge ourselves about and hide away in the corners because they think we think that's what's going to push people away. Oh, for shame. That's where the reverse is true. It actually brings us closer together. And there's a sort of a relief there of like, oh, I'm not the only one. And it's my hope that as we continue to do this kind of thing, that we leave these events just feeling a little bit more filled up with not necessarily plutonium, but whatever fuel that you choose for the rest of the week, the rest of the month, however long you want to see, so that when those fences do show up, you can maybe acknowledge them but realize by the time I get a little bit further down the line, that thing might not even be there. There are some fences that some of the people that are going to talk with us here tonight have overcome, not knowing what their biological family is, overcoming a lot of trauma from the surroundings that they grew up in, getting healthy and helping other people choose a healthy lifestyle, being given a diagnosis that's basically at first blush a death sentence. And every single one of these people has looked at that fence and mashed the throttle just the same. And you're going to hear their stories here tonight. It's a hell of a fuel. There is one common factor. And what is it that drives us forward even when we're doubting ourselves? What is it? You heard it in the song that I took the stage to. It's love. Fear is firm, but love is stronger. Go ahead and test it. Let me know how it works out. Choose love when you can. Of yourself, of what you do, of how you do it, of the people around you. And it's going to be a pretty magical thing. Do that. Otherwise, Darth Vader is going to come down from the planet Vulcan and melt your brain. That's also from the movie, by the way. That probably sounded really threatening if you haven't seen that and didn't understand. 
All right, I want to introduce you to the people who are here to share their stories with us tonight and celebrate the power of love. So we're going to go on a little bit of a time-traveling adventure to hear a little bit about the past and get a glimpse into the future. Are you with me? Yeah. All right. Thank you. So let's introduce them. Noah, time circuit's on, please. By the way... Once this small Mondays hits 88 miles per hour, you're going to see some serious shit. 